Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast in association with Charles Tirrett, whose new partner Joe Root just played his part in an all-time classic of a test match in Royal Pindi. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to tell that I'm wearing one of the Charles Tirrett jumpers. Over here in the UK, temperatures are set to dip below freezing this week and this jumper I've got on now has served me extremely well so far this winter. I would highly recommend having a look at their winter collection for both comfort and warmth. Phil and Ben are in a couple of different Charles Tirrett items at the moment. Charles Tirrett are offering our podcast listeners and viewers 20% off their collection. So if you fancy adding to your winter wardrobe, why not head online to charlestirrett.com and use the promotional code WISDOM22 to get 20% off their whole range. That includes shirts, polos, chinos, knitwear, and outdoor clothing, outerwear. We'll leave a link to their site and a reminder of the code in the description. Anyway, on with the show. A test match like which we've never really seen before. Nasser Hussain called it one of the great England test wins and one of the great captaincy performances from Ben Stokes. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today in the studio to talk through that extraordinary England win is Phil Walker and Ben Gardner. But first, let's hear from Mark Butcher. Mark, you're a long-time former teammate and your former captain, Nasser Hussain, wide regarded as one of England's best ever captains. He said that that was one of the greatest captaincy performances he'd ever seen from Ben Stokes. Can you explain what was so special about what Stokes did over the last five days? Um, yeah, I mean, and I completely agree. I put it to Mike Atherton afterwards out of the ground that the last time I think I can remember a somebody getting a man of the match award for his captaincy alone was John Abrams back in a NatWest final for Lancashire, God knows how long ago. And, and I, I think he should have got the man of the match just for that. I mean, there were stunning performances from England throughout. So um, he had a, he had plenty of stiff competition, but Oh my goodness, you know, he, he realized, they realized very, very early on that they were going to have to score and at, at even a ridiculous rate, even for them after what we saw from them this summer. Um, you know, they bowled out and 100 overs, 100 overs for 600. I mean, it's just it's at, utterly diabolical. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then came out and went even faster second time round. Never any thought really for, um, other than to to give themselves 100 overs or whatever. However, it didn't, it didn't even end up being that many, but as many overs as they possibly could. So he was always going to bail out at T. Um, finding a way to take 20 wickets on that pitch without sort of a crackerjack, worn, muralitharan, you know, that that type of spin bowler, or without any real express pace is just incredible. To do it the first time was amazing. To do it the second time against the clock was just out of this world. Um, and and, the, and the, the thorough, the total and utter unwavering commitment to making sure that the game reached a, reached a conclusion. Um, a positive conclusion one way or the other and, you know, being willing to lose the game in order to give themselves a chance to win it and sticking by that come hell or high water. Um, it was just, it was just a magnificent performance. It really was. And, and people, some people might be sort of thinking we're all losing our minds here and, and there's a lot of hyperbole, hyperbole floating around. But if you've ever played on surfaces like that, or you just look through some score books, score books and, and, and scorecards of test matches played in Islamabad or played in Pakistan on surfaces like that, uh, and tell me if there's anything you can find that is remotely like what just happened over the last five days. And if you can, I'll give you a biscuit. <laughs> you, you've been you've been very open minded uh, about the way in which Stokes and McCullum have wanted their team to play uh, since they came in. Others uh, in in the punditry game might not have been so, and there, there is this fear of what they're doing almost. And there's people don't like to see this England team almost not really care about the possibility of losing. What what would you say to that that criticism of what Stokes and Co are doing? Because they 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 are properly embracing this idea of so what if we lose? Yeah, and I think again, I think the main thing really just sit back sit back and watch it. Sit back and watch it, and and are you thinking when you're sitting back and watching it? Are you thinking um, that you're that you're watching sort of like a, a stressful results related contest, or are you sitting there being entertained by people playing a game? <laughs> and that and that's kind of that's the crux of it to me. They they've kind of stripped away all of the uh, the external pressures of of expectation and um, 
you know, there's enough pressure anyway, uh, playing international sport, the, the expectation or, or the, the worry that sort of losing a, a test match is the end of the world, you know, and, and it kind of felt like that at times when we were playing test match cricket. That's why you would kind of, you know, you, you would you would do your very best. And the first thing was not to lose. And the second thing was win if you kept win if you could. And, and most teams play it like that. You, you could argue that the Australian teams of the 90s and the thousands were not like that and that the West Indies with their with their great teams, the only thing that they were thinking about were winning. But generally speaking, most t- test cricket is based around the idea that the first thing, first and foremost, hard rule, don't lose. And they've just got, nah, it's not that. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. Why don't we do everything we possibly can to try and win? Um, and 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 there, I don't I don't understand why anyone would have a problem with that. I think it's utterly fantastic. The fact that the, the ground at Islamabad filled up as the day went on, on a on a you know on a pitch like that, and that even as Pakistan were were looking like losing the game, the people didn't leave, and they applauded England off the field all the way from the from the middle to the to the ed- boundary edge. Because I think, you know, the Pakistan cricket fans know know the game. They really know the game and they love the game. And I think they understood that they witnessed something truly, um, truly remarkable out there t- today mm. or over the course of the last five days. Yeah, it, it's now seven wins from eight with St- with Stokes as captain. Uh, pretty much all seven of those wins have been remarkable for one reason or another. There's not really been a normal, inverted commas, test match win in there. Do you think we're now getting to the point with England now having this landmark overseas win. I know it's just one test match. Do you think we're getting to the point now where other teams are going to be looking like, hang on, England just won a test match on that pitch with that bowling attack. Should we be Should we be trying to do this as well? I, I think it could become contagious. I think it, you know, it put Pakistan in a sort of position where, whereby they, you know, they had to, they had to try and co- go along with it and win the game because, you know, it's almost like being ungracious hosts if your if your visitors come along and and throw everything open to you and say come on we're we're bringing you along with us we're giving you a chance to win a test match here um, that perhaps you you don't really deserve you know that, to, to be fair they didn't play bad cricket at all you know they bowled England out they also scored a, 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 in in normal test match cricket they scored at a pretty good rate to get five hundred and well what was what was it seventy eight runs behind England's mammoth first innings total so they played good cricket too um, yeah I, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, the the other thing that I think needs needs saying is that um, people are imagining that all of this is just basically, you know, you, you blunder through the door, you you have a slog, um, you know, there's no thought in it. It's just kind of this this bull in a china shop type cricket. Well, I mean, listening to Ben Stokes at the end of the game, it was, it was anything but that. You know, he'd calculated, he'd calculated what they needed to do in order to get themselves into a position on the final day where they might be able to win the game. He calculated the type of bowling that he was going to need at various points of time during the match. You know, he, obviously you're stuck with the, with the players that you've got in the 11, but it was kind of like he held himself back. He, he, he bowled with the new ball in the second innings. Jimmy Anderson didn't take the new ball because he had, he had the freshest legs and bowling short was what they were going to do to try and set the ball rolling. Tick, that worked. Didn't take the second new ball when the, when the old one was reversing. I mean, you know, that, that was a stroke of luck there. This is the other part of it. His thinking is nimble enough that when, when things change and when the different things present themselves he's able then to take advantage of it he doesn't kind of get stuck in a mode they change the ball um which he wasn't very happy with because it looked awful and then suddenly that one the one that they got rid of the old one for just started to go sideways and so he went all in in that middle session with the three seam bowlers and i'm sitting there on the sofa going okay yeah i, I see this i get it um but I would have bailed out and, and had Jack Leach come on and, and bowl and, and try and hold one end so that he, you know, so that they were fresher, so that the quicks could go at the other end. But, you know, he just went, no, sod it. And they just kept running in. And I thought, well, five wickets to get, knowing there was only going to be 20, 20 overs left in the afternoon. I thought, well, I, I'm not sure they can, I'm not sure they're going to have the energy to do it. Um, and But he didn't miss a beat. He did not miss a thing. And he and he spoke about it in terms of what, what he imagined was going to, if we do this, then this is likely to be the outcome. Then we're going to need to do this in order to move it on still further. The whole thing was like mapped out in his head. And then he moved around, um, you know, w- w- with with the way that things change as they always do in sport in order to kind of to, to keep the, the end vision in sight. I think it was it was an absolute masterclass. I really do. I thought it was a stunning performance from him. Mm. And just final question. Does he remind you of anyone as captain? Do you remember a captain quite like him to have this impact 
this quickly, but also, as you described, to have the clarity of thought to kind of grasp and mould a game uh, at his will. I don't, I don't, I don't remember anybody being as as quite as bold as this. I mean, Adam Holly, and I'd always come back to this. Adam Holly, who took over at, at Surrey at, when he was what 24, 25, was very similar in terms of, of wanting to think about the game in a different way, trying to throw open um, new ideas and new possibilities, try to overturn all of the sort of like the stuffy conventional wisdoms and whatever he did that and he also was brilliant at carrying other people along with him he had that force of personality that slight slight tinge of danger about him as a personality that meant um you know when when he when he did need to kind of bark he did, people went that way too um but in terms of in terms of literally bucking uh, hundreds a hundred odd years worth of trends in a in a sport and saying actually all of this stuff that you've said was was the only way that this could be done it's all rubbish we're going to do we're going to do it another way i can't think of anybody and mm. and never have i been more pleased with myself yes than with the sas rogue heroes <laughs> um uh, analogy before we before we got underway with this because that was just it was completely barking what they did in this test match and, and, defi broke. and definitely a shout that he's more paddy than um captain sterling as well, I mean, that was <laughs> definitely as well. More paddy. <laughs> it was but it was uh man it was so good and and i can i can just imagine them in that dressing room you know i was involved in in a handful i suppose over all the the away test matches that i played um, a handful of test match wins and, and they and they the, the celebrations and the feeling afterwards still stick with me now like melbourne and in, in, when dean headley took six for um you know the, the sydney test on the on the on the following ashes tour the three that we won in the west indies um you know they were they were few and far between back in those days but my god they felt great and those guys will will remember today in the last four days the rest of their lives you've got debutants making hundreds and and, and taking six for you've just got Stunning performances everywhere. You know, Ollie Pope. I mean, how must he have felt when, as the lights were the light was closing in, and he clanged two in the last session and caught a screamer down the leg side. Um, the team was, you know, the team was decimated with with uh, with a virus before it even started. At the end, they turn out winners. It's just magnificent. Hmm. It's a good place to leave it. Cheers, Butch. Uh, catch you soon. We're pretty much just going to focus on the test today. Uh, we'll have a bonus episode on Wednesday to cover everything else that's been happening in the world game over the last week or so. But th this test match was totally crazy. England scored. Uh, it's worth going over the numbers just to remind ourselves of how crazy it was. England scored 921 runs, a uh, run rate of 6.73 and over. In the second innings, Give England's favour. <laughs> in the second innings, England's run rate of seven point three six was quicker than the rate they scored in all but two of their games at the recent T Twenty World Cup that they won. In tests where a side has scored more than four hundred runs in a game, England's scoring rate of six point seven three was a whole run per over quicker than the previous record. Uh, in a way, given England's wretched record on flat wickets overseas, that's that's probably the most impressive win of the Stokes McCullum era. Ben Sam asks, is that England's greatest ever win? Oh well, first of all, it's by distance the most impressive win of the Stokes McCullum era. Obviously there were others which were remarkable in their own ways, but those were remarkable because of the positions England came back from. This was totally complete right from what the first over that England hit for 14 runs, which is also a record for <laughs> runs they scored in the first over of a test. Uh, and from that point on they they didn't put a, a foot wrong all game pretty much um and so thinking about other test wins it compares to that England have had uh weirdly because we asked this question what just a, just under two years ago when they won that first test in India um and and uh, and that still is right up there that one I mean you'd say the opposition is was slight was was better in that game no one goes to India and wins uh, that was also a flat pitch they had to defeat they had to defy um uh, and yeah, an England team at maybe a slightly lower ebb as well. Although at that point, it felt like England were on the rise again and then it obviously all came crashing down. And then I remember writing a piece then about it was England's greatest win since when exactly. And I had to go back to 1990 and the first test of uh, their tour of the West Indies, which is the last time they'd gone to the best team in the world and like drubbed them, basically put together a complete performance to totally overcome them in a live game. Um, so those to be up there. There's also, I feel like there's a comparison to be made with the 2004 tour of South Africa, 2004-05, uh, 
uh, when England were sort of a resurgent team after a period of being really low. Um, but this felt like a new test of their metal after a dominant summer. And I think it was the fourth test of that series. Obviously, it wasn't anywhere near the ridiculous run rates in this game, uh, but they had to score quickly, sort of uh, bowl their hearts out and get a sort of a, a quite a, 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 a tough a tough late win on that in that game as well. So I guess th- those are some comparisons, but this is better than those because uh, because there were because if England had played even slightly worse in any of the departments, uh, they wouldn't have won this game. And uh, and they were so so good, and they needed to be that good to win the game because of what the surface was like. So it's really hard to think of uh, a win that compares to it, really. And obviously, you don't want to be too hyperbolic, but like that's, that's you're kind of forced to in this case. Oh, well, you're slightly what, older than Ben. You watch a little bit more cricket than Ben. Can, can I ask you the question? What do you think? Um, it was part part of why it was so impressive is the pitch, and then two, the England bowling lineup. Like Will Jacks basically took up first class offspin last year, this year. And he bowled 50 overs in what, what we all agree is one of the great England wins. So I think given the tools at their disposal and the pitch they came across, you know, if they if they played traditional test match cricket, there was some pundits were criticising England's approach throughout a lot of the test match. And even the end uh, were kind of implying they could have gone about it differently. If England played normal test match cricket, uh, I think they have a less than 1% chance of winning that test match. Um, 14 wickets were taken on the same pitch early in the year, Australia, Pakistan. Uh, if you The last day was 260 for North. Exactly, exactly. And I know the ball was reversing on day five, but the pitch was still was still extremely slow and extremely flat. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's right up there. Um, the reason why I wouldn't put it top is calibre of the opposition. I, don't, I think Pakistan were, were really quite bad uh, in this game and, and really helped England. But yeah, obviously England did pretty much everything they they could have done. What what, what do you reckon? Oh, it's fun, isn't it? (laughs) Stuff like this. Uh, Gardner mentioned the Sabina Park game in 1990 uh, for sheer shock value. I mean, believe it or not, mate, I was too young to remember it properly. Uh, I'd have been nine Mm. or maybe ten. And I guess... But anyway, look, my point is is that, that, that... that 1989 summer under Gower was the mother of all horror shows. Uh, and half of his team were literally plotting in the Old Trafford dressing room to go on a South Africa rebel tour. Gower obviously was sacked at the end of that tour. Gooch took over. He brought in a load of kids, nowhere near ready to face the mighty West Indies. And they had all of their players available for them, the Windies. Um, don't need to go through the names because you know them. Uh, this is Jamaica where the West Indies don't lose to anybody let alone uh, a, a rabble that passes for an England test team. Bear in mind, of course, they hadn't, England hadn't won a game against West Indies for, well, since I think 1974, maybe 1976. Uh, and they went out there and they won it, I think, yeah, won it by nine wickets um, and maybe even 10 wickets. But that game was as extraordinary as this, uh, but it's not as significant as this. And... Uh, and you can look at Melbourne 2010. That was that had great significance, albeit again against a weirdly listing team with obvious vulnerabilities in Australia, and a, a freakish game as well. You know, and and you can get that where where a team just is blown away in a session bizarrely, and that obviously then shapes the rest of the game. You can obviously count that in this in this conversation. That felt very significant at the time and was, uh, but the wider more far-reaching significance of what's happened this week, I think, makes it hard to argue against. I really do, because the eyes of the whole cricketing world would be on that. Uh, And, you know, people are queuing up around the world from Glenn Maxwell to, you know, Harsher Bogle to to, all points in between. People will be open mouthed, jaw dropping to the floor at what what they are seeing now evolve in real time, and the the knock on effect uh, could be genuinely quite profound for the future of the game. And mm. I know that sounds bollocks and overblown, um, and I'm a, totally aware of that. But that's that is what is at stake. Mm. We can't underestimate how fragile the game is. More fragile than it's ever been before for the five day game. A year and a half ago, the, the ICC boss, Barkley, came out and said, well, Test Creek is not fit for purpose in the modern world. Shrugged his shoulders, picked up his pay packet. That's what's on 
the line here. And so what you're seeing is uh, a kind of, like a, like a revolt, if mm. you like, against perceived wisdom that the game slowly ebbs away and becomes ever more anachronistic and ever more outside of the realms of what people actually want in an ever-changing world with shorter attention spans and instant gratuity, blah, 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 blah. Well, what you're seeing here is uh, a blueprint for a different way of thinking about the whole game. And hearing McCollum speak before the test match start, it almost sounds like winning is the second priority. They want to entertain, they want to bring the game forward and get people talking about it. And if you watch any of the Australia West Indies series, the commentators are talking about what England are doing. They see what England are doing and they wonder, can other teams do it? Um, how sustainable it is? And, and you meant, and, and also on global interest, normally when England win, all our questions are in from England fans. But today we've got quite a few questions from people in other parts of the world who are just fascinated by, by what they're seeing. Um, I'm going to read out a couple of Great email threads from Basball non-believers that we got this morning. So at 9 a.m., Ollie wrote in to say, Hi, lads. Oh, don't name and shame. Come on. I please. actually asked him. Oh, it, okay, I fine. actually asked him. <laughs> so he, he said he said it's okay. At 9 a.m., Ollie wrote in to say, Hi, lads. Why does Ben Stokes keep batting like that? Then at 11.43, he emailed in to say, I now realise this is astonishingly negative, And given his captaincy, he just won us the test. I'm a very stupid man. I shall save this pessimism <laughs> for another time. Nice. Uh, another uh, listener emailed in at 9.54 uh, and they wrote to say, isn't the point of a dangle the carrot declaration to elicit some risk taking? Pakistan have batted conservatively and barring wickets are still on course to chase the total with ample time remaining. Then uh, less than two hours later, he wrote back to say, fair play, utterly inspired, even if they drew that, to have that climax on that pitch. Utterly inspiring. My my mate Jeff has dropped himself in the clarts yesterday afternoon. He was he was spitting out his cornflakes at Stokes's declaration. Um, could not understand why why he'd gone so early. It plays havoc with his world view, as it does. To be fair, a lot of people who who why hold this game so very offended? dear. Why are people so offended? Because one question we got in was uh, from Alex said, England have turned a test played on the M25 into a game that gave us a real battle and a brilliant day five. Would you say most England fans are happy to sacrifice losing to play this brand of entertaining test match cricket? I personally love this style. It's refreshing. But we had uh, other questions basically saying that is Stokes getting too much credit? Um, is he getting too much praise? Is this genius or is it just a gamble that paid off? It seems that like a lot of England fans are actually a lot more... Uh, don't want England to lose a lot more than the actual team do. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, and uh, to be honest, I I just want to finish up on Jeffers. <laughs> I don't want Test cricket to be fun. I want it to be hard, grueling, and miserable. It should be a metaphor for life, not Noel's house party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I got up at five a.m. for every well, just before because the uh, the, the overs lost for every day of this game, uh, and some of this was hard, grueling, and, and miserable, <laughs> especially uh, <laughs> quite a lot of day two and that Emma uh, Hak Abdullah Shafiq partnership um yeah because i because i guess uh, i mean it's it felt to me at the time like you know i thought england were going to declare pretty soon after t but it just it, and i guess it and it was just perfectly timed and but at the time it felt like it maybe could have been slightly early and, and and that dangling the carrot thing uh there there was a question there but then it and it was just inspired he just proved it wasn't just a brilliant declaration because it was brave it was brilliant from a a cricketing logic point of view in terms of if you just do all the sums look at you know how long teams were the, the teams were getting how when stumps was being called and how how, how, how quick be. they'd batted in their first innings mm. as well three yeah. and a half and over would have got them to around where they ended up maybe with an extra 50 on top and uh, but, but i guess as well what, what they also gambled on was that those seamers would be able to get through a lot of work because that that's what actually although it, um uh th there was that period passage after lunch when um Rob well Stokes bowled an eleven over spell, which is absurd. Uh and uh Robinson and Anderson just weren't going for any runs at all. And actually that was when the rate started going again. And and then so, and so you had Paxson in two minds basically throughout the whole chase, not really knowing when to go for the draw, when to attack. And I think you saw that with the uh was it was it Rizman who got out to the Jennings catch? Um that 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 Robinson yeah. uh that, yeah Rob Robinson got him driving there. And you think like does, does he play that shot if he's not sort of a little bit unsure about if they're going for these runs, how fast needs to go to get to get these runs, or if they're going for the draw. And actually, I think at the time, people were wondering just from a cricket, pure cricketing point of view, was it a good declaration? But knowing that like it might be fun, 
Uh, but even from that, it ended up being a masterstroke. And uh, yeah, Soaks can kind of, of do no wrong at the moment. Mm. What would you say, Phil, to the to the uh, accusation, I guess, that Stokes is getting a bit too much praise, that it, all it was was a gamble uh, that paid off and that he probably would have got criticised had the gamble not paid off, that makes sense? Yeah. Um, uh, it, there is, to me, there's, there's cold, hard logic to everything that he, he seems to do. Um, and my instinct was, I understood why... Why he declared at the time, I absolutely understood uh, why he didn't really bowl himself in the first innings. What was the point? Um, he wouldn't have got much joy out there, out of there. And so, you, you let the spinners toil away for hour after hour, knowing that that's the best you're going to get on that track at that point in the game. And th- it's not simply just the tarmac underneath your feet; it's also what's happening within the the, the narrative of the game. But he he would have known that. Four days is a long time to bat, right? Um, he would have known that at the end of day one. And there would come a point where the epicness of his character would have come into play. So there was logic behind that as well. There was logic behind um, the selections. Uh, there was logic behind going for two spinners on debut because one of them might come off. Uh, <laughs> and even if they don't, then they're still going to have a whack at six and seven or seven and eight, wherever it was, which is which plays perfectly into Stokes's worldview anyway. Uh, and then what he did on the final day, uh, it's not the first time he's done it, right? We've sat around this table um, and, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding even more irritatingly hyperbolic than normal, I have said, I just think he's an extraordinary on-field captain. And you don't, I didn't know, <laughs> I, I haven't really understood what that means as as much as I do now, having watched it. And when you watch it live as well, and you see his complete control of the landscape out there, it is, it is really a gift that he's got. A gift that he probably hid in plain sight for many, many years, right? Mm. You know, we, we knew he, he had great game sense with the bat. We knew that he had great sense of theatre. And we knew, obviously, he had, you know, balls the size of Kent, right? We knew all of that, but... What we didn't know was how astute he he is, um, and look, so much from what you read, you know, so much of captaincy is combining imagination with strength of belief and decisiveness, and he has all of that hmm. more than any any captain that I've seen run an England team. And it's not simply just saying go out there and express yourself. It's it, I'm talking about what he does on the pitch. Every bowling change for that last two hours was immaculate. And as soon as the old boys in the in the commentary box, you know, Abbott and Costello, as soon as those two started saying, oh, maybe he should, he's, he's already, he's, he's doing it. Mm. In the pressure of that situation, when, as Ben says, he's bowled for an hour and a half himself and he's, you know, he's sweating his knackers off and he's absolutely exhausted uh, physically, but mentally he is alive to that game as he ever, as, as at any other point in it. Mm. Uh, and I think that that is a mark of of his his gifts as a as a captain. Uh, and I, think, I, I think it's amazing. To, one to moment, get... sorry, one moment that stands out for me with his captaincy was uh, the second new ball in the first inning. So they take it with Pakistan still two down, and they take it just before lunch. So I guess conventional wisdom there would suggest maybe you take it before lunch and give it to the quicks, and they kind of get two goes with it, or maybe you just sit in until after lunch, and then they're refreshed and they come back with the new ball and take it. And he takes it and he gives it to to, to Jack Leach. Uh, who then uh, takes a wicket before lunch? All of a sudden, and have three wickets in that session, and the door is is kind of open. And I guess also the uh, the, the tactics with the new ball in the second innings as well were were inspired, realizing that there was no new ball swing on offer. So there's not even a point even trying it for an over or two. You try and rough it up straight away, and you think that if the ball is going to bounce, it's going to bounce with that new ball when it's hard. And they they well they they bounce out two wickets, and they also get Azhar Ali to to retire her as well. Um, those were two inspired captaincy mm. decisions, I would say. I, I, would, I would have given him man of the match. I'm not getting carried away. Uh, I'd have given him man of the match. Mm. And I think just... Even, th- even if he got a pair, I'd have yeah. given him man of the match. As it was, got, I think he got an 18 ball 40. <laughs> <laughs> Toss up. Uh, but yeah, I think it's... For that, I, for me, that they took 20 wickets is 
more of a deal than on that pitch with that attack is 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 more impressive than going at sevens. <laughs> uh, you know, no, no, it, 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 undoubtedly. How many, how many times have we talked before about how how England going to win overseas on pitches that aren't that helpful? We're like oh, they need to have they need to have someone who bowls ninety five miles per hour. They didn't have that. They had two guys who bowl. 80 at best right. at the moment yeah um I, I guess the, it, the, sorry so i was just to say that like, I was and, and, to, and the gun spinner uh, you know yeah all, all three are you know manful and mm. and leach is turning himself into a use really useful player under this stokes umbrella but again you think of the the limitations yeah uh, well, uh, the accepted wisdom of of the limitations when you look at it on paper so so to winkle out 20 on that yeah, but I think they've been pr- pragmatic and really given every bowler a very defined role. So in the past, England have gone uh, on these tours and been like kind of in hope. Let's hope the spinners uh, do the business for us. But they've been they've realised the spinners aren't going to bowl teams out uh, as as much as you, you want to on flat wickets. So they're going to have to do the containing role. Uh, we're not going to bother tiring out the quicks until it starts reversing. Yeah, it's been really well thought through the the, the entire time. And I was looking at not just England's record overseas, but England's over- record overseas on flat wickets over the last ten years is horrendous. The, uh, Chennai is probably the only Test match they won on a flat wicket overseas. Mm. When they won in South Africa, they've generally been pretty spicy wickets. When they won in Sri Lanka, they've been very spicy wickets. Um, in New Zealand away, West Indies away, Australia away, they haven't won a single Test on these tours, and often against not very good teams. So mm. I think that for it's, me it's, is a much more impressive achievement than being able to get talented batters who we're going to get to in a second, being able to score up sevens. Yeah, um, just dwelling briefly on uh, the seamers. The amount of movement that Ollie Robinson was getting in the last hour and a half was huge and very important for England's seam bowling immediate future. Uh, he's fit. Um, he's he's coming hard. Basically, they've been in the field for four days, and he came in hard. He looked in good shape. He was running back to his mark to get the ball, the overs in. Uh, but the point is, the point I'm sort of ramblingly getting to is, you look at his action and you think there's not much reverse swing opportunity in that action because it's very straight lines. He's not a particularly fast arm. Uh, he's a traditional looking seamer in that respect. And yet he was getting the ball going, a ball that was 80 something overs old even by the end. And he was getting it going significantly. Now, if if he can stay fit, stay motivated and uh, keep developing his, his skills on top of what is already an incredibly skillful bowler technically then England can actually hang their hat on him in the, the post-Anderson, mm. post-apocalyptic era. I was thinking uh, you, know, you should kind of want to enjoy watching these two bowl in tandem because you're obviously not going to get to to see it that often overseas, um, at least. And, and I thought it was, I know you wanted Stokes as, as, as the player of the match, but for me, in a game of seven centuries, I was really happy that one of those two got it. Um, I thought Robertson was was brilliant and he, he is so, so skillful. Yeah. Uh, like e- even when I saw somebody make the point that even last winter in Australia when he got criticised for his weight and his fitness, etc., he still was pretty good pulling at 75. He's still nicking um, Warner off for fun. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But, uh, the the big reverse in Ducker um, to Salman... Uh, Agan. That's, thank you. Yeah. Uh, that, that was the key moment because he mm. batted really nicely, I thought, and, and seemed like he... He had he had the the makings of getting the job done, you know, and that that delivery would have cleaned up anybody. It's gone late with the arm, beautifully beautifully done, really. And then Nassim Shah first ball hits the stumps. His stumps hard, <laughs> yeah. Weirdly, England were really unlucky today. Yeah, you know, Stokes beat the bat countless times. I think he beat uh, Nassim Shah's bat four times in a row mm. at one point. Then there was that nick through the slips. The, the LBW shout that no one could believe was was going over. One of the only balls that bounced all test match. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was going over. First um, <laughs> Can I also have another smug moment? Go for it. Cheers. <laughs> uh, I won some money. So I put, I put money on England to win it after day one. I just thought four days, even yeah. on that, four days to bat. Mm. Four days to save a game. <laughs> That's what that was, was all that was on the cards. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and when it comes to the, the, the 20 wickets thing... Uh, it's, it's, it's a very obvious point uh, and this everything is geared towards it but that that's why England <laughs> bat so quickly uh, like um uh, you know they, they batted for less than two days over the the entire game uh Pakistan they only, only once the team scored more runs and lost a test match than Pakistan in this game uh, and I guess that's the other thing like if you don't have an express quick or you know a, a, a wizard leggy or or some other 
uh, sort of special weapon, then the other thing you can just have is time. And yeah. if you have enough time, eventually you'll get a period where it's in your favour or wickets will just fall because that's what happens. Babrazan will cut your, your part-time off spinner to point mm. uh, and then you will just eventually that that will happen 20 times and you'll win a game. And that's, yeah. and that's, exactly that's that. just the plan. Uh, uh, just, just on Anderson, who we've got to talk about uh, a little bit, Robert Sanya tweeted us a stat, uh, a minor stat note to an incredible test match. Anderson's economy rate, 1.9 runs and over. Uh, the rest in the test match, 4.9 runs and over. He's a seam bowler on a flat track in Pakistan with an economy rate as if he's playing at Old Trafford in April or May. Uh, and Anderson was was just as good uh, as Ollie Robinson. Um, One of the great... British sportsman of all time. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as is Stokes. Um, mm. I mean, he might be the actual great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. If, brackets, when uh, our brave boys out in the Middle East get uh, knocked out on Friday, then Stokes odds on for sports personality of the year to win it twice. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Ho- ho- to- hopefully, Harry and the boys keep on going. <laughs> but should they, should they, they fall down yeah. on Friday, then... Stokes, all bets are off. Yeah. Just on uh, the start of the pod, we were talking about greatest England wins. I was thinking in, in the time between you starting watching cricket and, and me starting watching cricket, England just didn't win that much. So there weren't many contenders in that intervening period. No. Um, and yeah, it didn't seem to matter that much. Yeah. In, in, I was still obsessed, fixated with it. And weirdly, I feel like I still am. I walked, I saw the game at home, walked in for this, this show today and couldn't think about anything else. You know, again, totally uh, enwrapped by it. You know, Some, something else that struck me. I was on the on the tube, looking around, and thinking how few people know what's happened. Yeah, I got up to that. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And and how sad that is. Yeah. You know, it's 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 like being given this great novel, and people saying, "Nah, I don't really read books." Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, or an amazing album that's changed, that cha- you know, defines how you see the world. And people say, no, no, I don't have any headphones. Yeah. Well, the other thing I wonder, and this probably comes from a position of uh, on- entrepreneurial ignorance, uh, is all this chat about private investment in, in T20 leagues. I'm like, well, there's a thing that most people who actually like cricket think is much better than all the things you're spending a lot of money on. Still so, the thing that makes the ECB money. Exactly, exactly. Um, anyway, for another show. Uh, all the chat on on how revolutionary this approach is, I think does a disservice uh, and kind of overlooks the skill that's actually required to execute the game plan. It was obviously extremely flat, but England scored at a rate that was completely different to Pakistan. Uh, and as we've said before, but it's worth saying again, without that scoring rate, there's absolutely no way that England can be in a position to force that victory. Ben, Crawley, Duckett, Pope, Root, Brook were, were absolutely brilliant. And I think Brook in particular was 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 special. Yeah, they, they were all really good. And, and they were all so good that they kind <laughs> of uh, diminished each other's excellence, <laughs> except from Brook somehow. Like ev- everyone else, you're kind of like, okay, well, Wicket's a bit flat. Everyone's going around fun. And then Brook is kind of like, this guy is absolutely amazing. I don't, I don't really know what it was about Brook's innings that kind of somehow stood out more. But he just... Uh, We've got to say the stat, which he, he twice broke the all-time England record for the most runs up and over yeah, in, in the same days. test match. Yeah, I mean, he scored, I think I think it's 240 of 181 in the test. He now strokes uh, 125 in test cricket. Yes, yeah. So yeah, it, it, he, he, he was amazing. And I, and I mean, it, it is worth dwelling on a few of the individual stories because mm, as definitely. much as it kind of all melded into one. I mean, yeah, that, that first day watching it, I felt a bit like, um, you know, on, on, on like... on. Christmas day not not like Christmas morning but like Christmas <laughs> afternoon when you're sort of like you're just sort of like slumped on the sofa and you're just like you don't really want to keep eating chocolate but there's just like a box of quality street next to you and so you reach and you take it that's how it felt with with <laughs> England test centuries basically it's like, oh, another one is like, oh, go on then uh but that, we, we, we had our pre-Christmas do for my wife's mates uh at our place like yesterday mm-hmm. and I was eating oysters at about midnight and no one else could go near them so yeah I don't feel fabulous today, <laughs> truth be um, but, but But on the individual stories, obviously Crawley, uh, this, this was an absolutely massive game for him and a massive mm. tour because this He is can what, bat! Well, yeah, How but, many more times? And you know, he's, he's, got, he's got a century in a, in a win now, which is great. Uh, and <laughs> obviously everything was ge- gearing towards this. And so there was pressure there. Like if, he's, if he then struggles now, uh, then that is a, obviously a massive deal because this is the point of Crawley. And he didn't show any of that pressure. You know, he was, he was brilliant from... Uh, from the very first over, obviously Duckett 
Uh, this has been a this is the end of a, a, a huge journey for him from what getting undone by Ashwin six years ago, sort of going back to the Wilderness, going down to Div Two, switching counties, and then building a just a properly formidable record that is better than anyone else in the countries and getting his way into the team through sure through his style which fits with the team but just through weighted runs as well and then in a position he doesn't really bat anymore in first class cricket yeah yeah and 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 again playing with with that freedom which is obviously everyone does it in this England team so it doesn't um uh it almost feels less remarkable for a guy to come back into the side uh at that age when you know you know you're not going to get many more goes uh and to and to bat like that was was also incredible I mean Pope I suppose the most remarkable thing is that he also kept pretty well barring a few little blemishes what a catch mm. yeah yeah the one At down the, the, leg, the leg side was, all right was, you know he grasped one off as a again down the leg side mm. obviously let him and Root had that little miscommunication, Moment. let's say. But what a catch mm. to, to round it up at the end. That was an absolute stunner. And it felt like watching him at the Oval. Like, it's like, it's like finally... a cut to folks as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Straight yeah. around. Very good work um, by, by, the, by the boss, whoever that was. But I think, obviously, he's, had, he's, had, he's scored a couple of test hundreds. Uh, but I think we, were, we watch him so much at the Oval. He's wanting to bat like that for England. And that, that was Pope at his natural best. It, yeah. it was It was as fluent and technically perfect to not because you can get mm. caveats whatever pitches whatever mm. um inexperienced attack whatever technically superb um it was weirdly like watching bell and peterson when he was batting with brook mm. uh brook is so charismatic a cricketer that he's going to put everybody in the shade and even actually i thought after the first day first day maybe the second day, i can't remember but anyway those two were interviewed by Sky, it was first day. And, you know, Pope's a really likeable lad, but it was very much, you know, just really pleased to be a part of the team and really pleased for Zach and really pleased for Ben and and all of that. And then it turned to Brooke and they said, well, you know, six fours in the over, Harry. And he said, yeah, it was six bad balls. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I had to hit him for four. Um, and it struck me just in that interview, I know, you know, Pope has done a job or two captaining Surrey and I know he captained the warm-up game there's only one England captain in those two and it's not Ollie Pope mm. uh prediction time Harry Brook is the next England test captain unless Ben Stokes falls over tomorrow if Ben Stokes does a job for another two years Harry Brook's England's next test captain how going a bit off topic but how do you think Brook lines up in this team when Bear Stokes back well so, so there's days I mean, in it yeah no <laughs> but that, that's the assumption there, there's loads to happen between now and then uh I mean, so and and as as much as you know, D- Duckett and Crawley did did play really well. I don't think you can ink either of those two names in for the first test of the summer yet. Personally, I mean, hopefully that's what happens, but I don't think you, you can definitely do that. Uh, and so it might well be that if if one of them does struggle over the rest of the winter, and you want to get Bairstow back in, England just think, well, this Harry Brook's really good. Let's just push him up to to open. I mean, that that people suggest it during this summer. Uh, and that might well be the solution. The other one, and it's it's not very fair, but he's had to deal with a lot of things that have not been very fair, is to ask Bairstow to uh, keep wicket, maybe moving down to or either have him down at number six or uh, have a number seven or have Ben Stokes at number seven, which is might might well suit if he's if he's captaining lots and he's batting the way he is. That might be a a role that suits him, and then have have Brook at five. Th- those are the two ways England I can see that England can do it mm. How do you see right it, yes? now I suppose probably that best at best over the gloves I think um, uh, kind of harsh on folks but he's not he's not scored millions of runs uh, best does kept well for England before I mean you, you, I'd keep I wouldn't with a talent like Brooke I think it'd be unfair on him and you're possibly damaging what you could get out of him if you ask him to open so I'd be like you've got your runs at five um, that's where he bats he bats in the middle order for, for Yorkshire. I think it'd be unfair to... Like, also, like, let, let's be honest, who are we playing next? There's home matches against one of the best tacks in the world. You can't give a guy who's not really open before uh, tell, it, tell him to open against them. So I, yeah, I, that's how I'd go. It, it, England still might. England still might. Uh, <laughs> and I, so I think it is a bit of a shootout between uh, folks, Duck and I guess, I guess Crawley. He, he kind of keeps, mm. seems to keep his place, whatever happens. On, but there is, uh, on, on Crawley, I think it's really interesting that the more we see of him, especially he, he's... Obviously, he's got got a Test hundred last winter uh, in the West Indies, and he had that really good innings at Sydney. And the way he bats in this Test match, just comparing him to the openers that he kind of bats like Warner, Saywag, Hayden, those three guys had not very good records in England. And I and I wonder if 
Crawley has a really good series and a good winter, stays in the team, doesn't have a great summer at home. That eventually becomes how he's kind of used for England, that he's, he's like an away overseas opener because um, there's logic to that. There's a three great to the game who never really cracked it in England. And, it and it's no disgrace in, in England that they have? I think so, yeah. Well, Hayden got one here. You know, five. Maybe it's 200 then between them in England. Say, so I has got one as well, I think. Um, I have one, yeah. Um, and sorry, when we, and we, when we went going through the bat, we didn't even mention Root, who just decided to uh, to, to bat left-handed for a bit, <laughs> which was quite silly. Uh, and it's, it's just nice to see Root having having lots of fun, isn't it? Shining the ball on, on Jack Leach's head, mm. um, running off saying he needs a poo, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, Benjamin. He's, he, or Benedict, he, rather. <laughs> Root, Root, Root said it. I'm just a, I'm j- I'm just re- just a reporter. Um, <laughs> right. He's, uh, he's okay, just, fine. He's, 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 got, he's got that on. cheeky chappy thing back, doesn't he? Um, nice. Ben, we, we kind of made the point as, as we were watching it early on the test match. England were obviously great, but that really wasn't very good from Pakistan, who who were not good with with the ball and in and in the field, and they probably got selections wrong as well. With mm. with the bat, they I think quite a few after quite a few of the tests under Stokes, it's felt like the opposition haven't been very good. And I think the way England play obviously clouds the judgment of teams when they bat. Like we talked about how teams have been weird in the third innings against England before. But in the field and with the ball, Pakistan were were really poor. Yeah, I mean, in the field, there's quite a lot of mitigation, I suppose, in that that's just a very green attack and not a lot of that. And some of that isn't Pakistan's fault in terms of who's injured. They could have um, picked Hassan Ali and Mohamed Abbas. That, that's true. And that, they could have picked uh, a guy who... No, so good. Zaheed Mahmood, by the way, who, who had the most expensive figures for a test debutant, he um, quite often doesn't get into his state side behind the spinner who topped the wicket-taking charts by 14 wickets this season in Pakistan. So that, that just... And Sakhalay Mustaq... Uh, justify the selection by basically saying Mahmoud's been around the squad for longer. Yeah, like, that, it is his that. turn, which is which is kind of ridiculous. But he went for three hundred and nineteen <laughs> runs yeah. in the game. Yeah, that might be and probably will be his only Test match. Uh, got a double wicket maiden though, so he did. Root and Stokes as well. That's <laughs> a, yeah. That's a, um, but uh, yeah, Ben. Yeah. So so yeah. I mean, they they, they didn't bowl great, and although they obviously did score a lot of runs for a team to lose a Test match, then in a way they didn't bat great either um is, is I mean, it the highest score to lose a game the, the, it's uh no it's not the highest score to lose a game that's bangladesh against new zealand in 2017 i think right and it's the second most runs in a test match across both innings to lose a game right uh but so, yeah right up there um i mean and i guess that there's all there is a, a certain confusion around what they want to do with their batting lineup as well i mean azar ali who was out of the team for the last game comes back in for this one i guess we don't know yet if he's going to be fit for the next test with that blow he took on the hand uh that speaks to a bit of of confusion. I mean, Imam Imam Al Haq is a curious player who has this amazing record at Rawalpindi and hasn't done really anything elsewhere. Abdullah Shafiq does <laughs> that, look that really doesn't good. sound very curious to me. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> can I can I ask a quick question? Quick question. Yes. Um, would you rather see a three and a half day game or a game like that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I would say that this this obviously this is a great test win and it was a great last day, and I would hesitate to call it a great test match in some ways. And I feel like I'm justified to say it because I, I Cause sat watched through it all of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and, it, and, it, and it's not just that it was high scoring. It's that, and it, this, this is kind of that Christmas afternoon thing is that, um, that there just weren't those ebbs and flows. You can get teams making 550, 600, but there are times when they have to absorb pressure and then counterattack and go again. And there was none of that through really any of that first uh, four days until, until Pakistan came back. To uh, back. Yeah. I thought on the field, Baba's captaincy was painfully passive, almost defeatist on that mm. first day. And, you know, I'd, I'd believe it or not, fellas, I'd got up early as well to watch it on that first day. I was, I was absolutely buzzing for it. And I found that I was drifting in and out of that first day, even when watching these players who you root for doing what they were doing and making careers for themselves almost in, in front of your face. And yet I, I still felt this is not what Test Cricket should be there should be jeopardy on deliveries even on a flat one and there should be strategic ways that you can squeeze and stultify and you just didn't get any of that from mm. from Pakistan in the field uh, on that first first four sessions really mm. and, and and also but you didn't really get it when England were bowling in that first I think they stuck they stuck at they stuck at their task really well Stokes was trying lots of things but there wasn't it wasn't like a building of pressure that then resulted in a wicket it was like he tried lots and lots of things and and very occasionally they worked which is again it's it's not exactly gripping to watch and and, and that was really in stark contrast to, to the last day which was just kind of unimpeachably 
uh, exciting, enthralling test cricket. I mean, you had right from the the start when the two paces were impossible to get away, and that made it all the more exciting when Rizwan took the attack to England spinners, and then you're going from our oh, Pakistan are going to really struggle to get these runs here, and you know England have, have, have got a breakthrough to oh wow all, all of a sudden they're, they're scoring really quickly what are you going to do after lunch can they bowl the spinners and they end up not and that makes Stokes have to bowl that spell and and that and that's like you know that there was still only a couple wickets in that passage of play but it was so much more interesting because of uh, uh, what the conditions allowed you to get that through any of the four days so I would yeah even though uh, we had that finish and even though England played so well you shouldn't have to play out of your skins and to score at like you know nearly sevens and uh and to do all the things that england did to still only just win a test match mm. in the final leaving and actually kind of almost lose it yeah we um, had... and so and so yeah that the pitch when it, it should still be well it should be rated poor it might be rated below average uh and it will probably be rated fine i think yeah I mean, we, had, we, had, we had a really good email on this from from John from Darwin, Australia, who wrote in to say, Hi team, love the pod. I'm writing midway through day five of the test match and the result looks likely. I think the wickets in both Perth, where Australia just played West Indies, and Royal Pindi have been terrible for cricket and yet we get results. Credit to the players for this, but how do we avoid these pitches where a glut of runs from average players making poor cricket to watch? I thought the same about the Adelaide pitch in 2006. Without that famous day five, it would have been the most boring game in memory. A, tr- a twist at the end makes us forget quite a lot of dull cricket. Are there rules or penalties that can be introduced to avoid this? Cheers, John. Um, yeah, I mean, so the the ICC do have this rating system where uh, grounds can get a demerit point um, if the ma- is it match referee decides that it's a below average pitch. I think it's match referee, but yeah. So you get one demerit point for below average pitch. And if you get five demerit points over a four or five, five year period, period yeah. you can get banned for 12 months from hosting international cricket. But a below average is only one point. So it needs to be really to, to have any weight. It's got to be a poor rating, which is, I think, three points. Uh, so that Australia-Pakistan test match at Royal Pindi early in the year only got one point. So you can have five of those, te- four of those test matches in a five-year period and you're not really punished. So there's a system in place, but I don't think it's a very good system. Yeah, there's only been one poor test match within sort of a or poor, poor test pitch as the ICC see it within uh, the current period that you can see through our website. And that was the the test that India played against Africa um, when it was almost called off. Mm. Do you remember that one? When they had to actually stop play on the second or third evening. The Joe Bird uh, game. Yeah, because of how much the, the ball was spitting and uneven bouncing. And it was basically dangerous out there. And then they just it rem- miraculously settled overnight. And if it weren't for that, uh, the game would have been, you know, one of the very, very few abandoned tests. And even that is, is <laughs> that's only three demerit points, you know. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. You, you, you can imagine there's quite a lot of political wranglings going on behind the scenes with stuff like that. You know, it would take a brave match referee to say, you know, rate the arm with a bad pitch poor. Was it Ahmed Abad or was it Ch- Chennai? Oh, you take your pick. Um, it was Ahmed Abad, Ahmed Abad the third test, the, which was yeah, a yeah, bit pig, crazy when Root yeah. took five yeah. for, for nothing. Yeah, uh, Take a brave match ref to do that, I suppose. Um, equally, uh, a test test match that we've just seen as prestigious as that, so important to Pakistan's rebuild process. Uh, again, you'd imagine that you know, that match ref's door would be being knocked on pretty heavily by mm. Ramiz Raja and Baba and and all kinds, you know. So, look, I totally agree that, that, that this, the system in place is too flimsy and not not uh, prosecuted hard, hard enough. Yeah, sure. Raja's coming in for a bit of criticism because he's been very critical of the pitch and saying that we're actually a few years away from having good five-day pitches in Pakistan. Oh, but, um, but he defended the ones against Australia. He hasn't this time. Interesting, uh, I didn't know and that. And he has... Um, but people have pointed out that <laughs> the pitches were fine before he became in charge. He became the PCB chairman. Well, it's um, it's a really odd situation because no, no one knows whose fault this is, basically. Like, everyone assumes it's sort of a diktat from from the top that's, you know, prepare a flat pitch yeah. and we'll, we'll get some draws and then we'll, we will we might sneak a win here, which is what, what the plan was against Australia. And yet Ramiz Raja is saying that, that is absolutely not what they intended to do. Uh, and then when you look at the uh, the Kaidi Azam trophy as well, the Pakistan's first class competition, the pitches in that are at Raul Pindi are absolutely fine. So Yeah, and the scores, situation. the average scores, I think I saw somebody say, you know, 
250 is yeah. about an average score across their first class tournament and up, the, and there's up to this one grass on the pitch sometimes mm. uh, so yeah it's, it's a really a really really strange there's one. a great line from Roger when he was on uh, TMS I think during day two where he said the only time Pakistan did not concede 30 runs in a five minute spell was when they were taking DRS reviews <laughs> which, which I thought was, uh, was um, quite funny w- I guess, you know, next game starts in, what, four days or something like that. So it would be hard to adjust the properties <laughs> of the pitch now. Mm. But now they are one down in the biggest series that they're going to play. Uh, you would think that they'd want to leave a little bit more spice and juice in that pitch, mm. you would think. But then does that actually play into England's hands even more? You feel like they have to gamble a little bit, but is it even sort of possible I mean, you, you could argue that they've nearly won the test match when they were second best in every department by quite a long way. So in a way, it nearly worked. Yeah, um, I, and, and I guess <laughs> if, if they had won the test match, you can, I, I feel like those next two pitches might have been, uh, might have made Raul Pindi look like a, a, a green, I'm, I'm, a green I'm, headingly seamer in it, April. It would have been quite possible. something if they'd won yeah, the game. Yeah, yeah. I, I asked Ben earlier with about 100 runs to go, it's like, have have Pakistan been better th- than England at anything in this test match? Um, and Ben said sponsorship I said, well, 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 activations. I, I said the sponsor activation. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, very good. Ben, yeah. Breaks, they, they, yeah. they were better than England for the first 70, 80 overs of their first innings. You know, in fairness, and, and yeah, they, yeah, they have got three centurions in this game. But but what? Sorry, what what were they better at than England? England. Oh right, better, okay, yeah, yeah, better, yeah. Captain sure. Betterfield. Um, better, yeah. yeah, but before we continue, a plug. Uh, for a new product in the Wisden shop. We've recently launched our limited edition pure wool cricket sweaters, which for those watching on YouTube, you can see Phil holding in front of his camera. The sweater was designed by specialist Crystal Knitwear, who are the official supplier of wool cricket sweaters for all MCC teams. There's limited stock available, so don't miss out on the perfect Christmas gift for any cricketer this year. Um, they are incredibly warm. So I think they're perfect for April and September cricket. I tell you what, Gardner, now he lives in Kensington and he's got a bit of <laughs> Charles Tirrett merch as well. I can see him just mm. over the shoulder. Mm, yeah. Can, yeah. Just punting down down the cam. Yeah. I can I realize, see actually. Yeah. But, but Pakistan sponsor activations haven't got uh, anything on ours, have they? No, <laughs> not, not at all. Not at all. Because life's too short mm. <laughs> to be cold in your jumper um it seemed like a very long time ago um but there were doubts about whether the test would start on time as half the england squad were locked up in their rooms with a with a viral bug on the day before the test match and it meant that will jacks came into the side in place of ben folks and ollie pope took the gloves um ben it's been a bugbear of yours for years that england don't give themselves enough backup for overseas series uh, should Ollie Pope be the backup for these tours? He took one very good catch that we talked about down the leg side, um, but he, he dropped Imam in the first innings. He let that one go between him and Root on day five. And also, if England bowl first, he's batting at number three and he could have been keeping for two days and then had to come in ball two. Well, I mean, that's an, that's what happened in the in the second innings, I guess, with Pope. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think ideally Pope wouldn't be your backup heat keeper. I think there's a little bit more leeway to give England here because of the nature of this tour. I know it's it's only you know it's a short three back to back tests tour, but they are wary of the stresses and strains they put players under in near bio bubble conditions, which is what this effectively is because of uh, the security things in place. But I think that uh, that mitigation is lessened because you know England have had this issue before with selection when they've kind of it's, and it's tough with the test squad because there are lots of things you have got to consider. You have got to think about obviously form. Uh, injury, the fact that you don't want to bring people along necessarily, but also that uh, that everyone there kind of might be required at some point. Basically, like you might have someone roll an ankle, and you've got to have sort of things in place for all of those situations. And for and for example, actually, until they added Rian Ahmed to the squad, they didn't have a backup for for Jack Leach really, uh, as in terms of a, an actual proper frontline spinner. And maybe people would argue that Ahmed isn't quite that mm. either. So he is though. Well, yeah, that that that's also. A, fa- a fairish point, yeah, that, um, that there yes. isn't a... <laughs> Only yeah. fairish. Um, but, you, you know... No, all right, <laughs> all right, you better but, say. Come yeah. on. Um, <laughs> Phil, what did you make of Will Jack's test debut? Coming in at about three minutes notice before uh, the toss, he bowled just under 50 overs over the course of the test match, as I mentioned earlier in the show. 
Uh, he basically didn't bowl in first class cricket until April this year. So, well, yeah, what did you make of his performance? And he did all right with the bat in both innings as well. Um, truth be told, uh, I didn't watch it live when he he had a bit of joy towards the back end of their first inning. So I wasn't watching it ball by ball. I saw m- most of his first spells. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought he bowled a bit full. Uh, he got driven a lot, bowled quite a few full tosses. Um, he's a he's a nice looking, conventional, occasional, part time off break bowler, as from what I can tell, at this point. Um, but uh, in in a team with sort of dizzying amounts of variety, you can absolutely see why 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 they wanted to have a look at him and why he's on that tour. Uh, you know, he's a batter who bowls a bit. Uh, and it could well be that you know he he emerges down the line as a Moeen Ali like cricketer. Uh, he did, didn't put that much on the ball that I saw. He doesn't give it a big rip and a rag, um, but he's clearly an, a very intelligent cricketer as well. And and I can see why he's a part of that mm. setup. Liam Livingston is injured going mm. home. He'd obviously was in the first, as you say, he was in that first eleven. Uh, you assume that Jax will probably stay in the side now, you would think? Yeah, I think it was interesting before, we, when we were doing the preview show, uh, Livingston, when the 11 was announced, was described as the third spin behind Root, but Jax was very much number two in between Root and Leach. So I was quite impressed. I, I agree with everything you said. I was quite impressed that he managed to bowl as much as he did. And yeah. Although at times was a bit loose, wasn't obliterated out of the attack. Still yeah. went. I mean, his economy rate at the end of the first innings is pretty much identical to leeches it is yeah um, just under four yeah. yeah so yeah that, that speaks again of, as i say of a smart cricketer um one who, one who knows his game and knows what he can and can't do doesn't try and overforce it uh i think it was a bit nervy in, in the first belly bold um considering that you come in with two minutes to go uh, i thought it was a really good effort uh and again just in brackets for him to barely bowl in in on day five again it's just another nod to to Stokes's clarity of thought as, mm. a, as a as a skipper, yeah, I, th- I think the the the, the Moen Ali thing though, I I struggle to see him comparing to Moen at yeah. Any point. So, to because, be honest, so do I. As 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 a natural, yeah, because 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 Mo- Mo- Moen could be, he he bowled bad balls and he and he would rarely properly contain. But right from when he came into the England Test team, he was getting out the best batters the opposition had. I mean, I think his was his first Test week Kumar Sangakara with an absolute beauty, and Moen has always had that ability. I, I, uh, I guess I, I echo that fair. One thing I'd say is that Jax is what, I don't know, 23, 24. Moen was barely bowled a first class delivery at that point and only really mm. began to take it seriously. But what he did have that Jax doesn't yet have is is a big turning off break. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think one thing to kind of look at for the rest of this tour and then in New Zealand as well is, is what McCullum and Stokes want from their spinner. Um, going forward in all conditions, I, I distinctively feel that they don't really see amazing use in having a specialist finger spinner who doesn't bat and and doesn't, uh, you know, on on paper didn't have a test match that dissimilar to the to the part timer. I think over time that might be something that becomes clearer over this winter, especially if we're going to get really fat pitches in Pakistan and New Zealand as we had recently. That's true because because Moen Ali actually would was a, a, a better wicket taking threat in England than than Leach is as yeah, well, you know, in terms definitely. of he he just performed a different sort of role and you're not I don't think you're going to replace him. I think that Moen is obviously he had his flaws, but the things that he did well uh are things that you just can't assume you're going to have of. Mm-hmm. C- could I just add on Jack's um Jack Leach is not a big turner of the ball anyway as we know, but when he bowled, say, in India at that time, you know, he was getting a lot of rag, albeit lots of bowlers were. But in this particular game, Jackson Leach had a similar kind of level of turn. So, mm. you know, with, I withhold a call on, on Jax's, you know, qualities at, at that level for another two or three test matches. Yeah, mm. you've got to see him bowl on different surfaces. It's just that we've seen him quite yeah. a lot of Surrey and he bowls long spells, containing spells, doesn't, take many wickets mm. uh, for the number of overs he bowls but does a job in modern modern red ball cricket teams and, and maybe that's what England might want sure. at home um, that, yeah. on, on Ben quickly on Pakistan some impressive performance with the bat obviously for them to score that many runs um, for you Abdullah Shafiq stood out 
Yeah, and again, it's it's hard to remember exactly why. Just apart from that, he just looked really good, even in that part. He was a bit more aggressive in this game than he was against Australia. Mm. Yes, yeah, and 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 I guess we've also just seen elsewhere that he he, he is more than just a, a flat track player. I mean, he played an absolutely yeah. in exceptional hundred against uh, against Sri Lanka that he what, hit one hundred and forty two not out to to chase down three hundred and forty in the final innings. Like that that is a that's a high class innings, and everything about him suggests that he is a, a, a high, high level player. I mean, he, his first he played a whip record. against Anderson. Yeah, that, one that was an amazing shot. Start, mm. The real amazing classic shot. shot. Uh, and that suggests that there's more of a player, more of an expansive player than we maybe saw in that initial tour. And yeah. I thought and when, he was, when he was batting against the England spinners, uh, whereas Imam, I think, was quite respectful to the spinners. I know that Jack's turning away from him is just slightly more difficult for him. But I thought Shafiq just had total control over what he was doing against against the English spinners in a way that I think only Bridi Baba also did for Pakistan. Um, a good test match for um, Gilbert Jessup as well, by the way. He still holds a record for the fastest ever test 100 for England. Can't be long before that that record is is broken. Um, so Brooke would have cruised there in the second yeah, innings, right? Yeah, and he well, he, it wouldn't have been a cruise because I think it seemed at one point in the first thing was like he was going to cruise there. Then I think he still needed like uh, twenty odd better than on a ball when he got out. I think so. He was on he was out for eighty seven from sixty five. So he had mm. how many balls to? I think the record seventy six. So he need, so he needed thirteen off ten to break it. So that's still not. He, he was he was on track, but uh, uh, I could uh, yeah. Yeah. Jessup's in trouble though. I think three of the fastest ten uh, England Test hundreds were were in this innings, in this Test match rather. Um, a few other odd moments, Ben. You've compiled a list of the of the weirdest moments from the Test match. Um, what what are the ones that we've missed? We've got Leach having his head used as the shining tool for yeah, getting, getting yeah. That, that that was quite fun. I mean, what there was a great moment just towards the end when there was the drinks break, uh, and obviously with Pakistan trying to block out for the draw, and then Muhammad Ali. Uh, uh, remembers that he, he needs a wee right at the end of the <laughs> probably just took on a bit too much uh, March Gatorade runs off and then just the look on Stokes and Pope's face as he comes back on sort of doing up his trouser strings uh, almost when he was going to forget that he's uh, washed his hands or he's, he's, he's left his bat in the loo or something that was that was great um, uh, you always yeah. wonder how far can players take it because in Pakistan it's not like it's the end of players you just can't see the ball yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I guess you could take it to even further extremes um, one, one, one extra serious talking point we've got to cover is obviously, as has been mentioned, Livingston has been ruled out of the tour. Uh, ben, how do you think Livingston will be replaced in the team in the squad? I guess the team folks comes in for him in the way that England were planning on lining up in the first place. But how do you think they're going to replace him in the squad? Yeah, I mean, I guess if I'm, they do. I, yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I'm not sure they will. I know you, you have your idea on on who could come in, uh, which is Sam Curran, which would make some sense. He does give England another option. That's another way they could reaching the 11 but it, it like I think Rian Ahmed is just he is the, the third player they have in that role and you kind of felt like I was actually surprised that uh they didn't pick Jamie Overton as Ben Folks's replacement in this he was lineup. In. uh well I but I think that didn't they've said they didn't influence their decision I think he might have even possibly become ill after the game started okay um so uh so and and so I, I mean it's weird they have you know they've only got four seamers, one of whom is unfit. You know, they've got three people in this very specific role and now they've got two of them, which I think is probably still fine. Mm. So, yeah. Mm, fair enough. Um, Hugh writes in to say, speaking as someone who's only really watched the highlights of this test match, but how many times can you hear Ollie Pope say, boy, boy, <laughs> yeah, boy, bowling Stokesy, boy, before having to lock yourself in a room with a Barney the Dinosaur music on repeat to smear your excrement up the walls. Well, I, mean. I, I have another issue as well, actually, which is because because Phil, you said after the um after day one, they were saying like Pope saying this well, has been batted. quite a scatological show. You said you said he. What you does said, that mean? Oh, I don't worry about it. You, you said he said a uh, sort of well batted Zach, well batted Ben. He didn't say Ben. He said Ducky, which uh, I really didn't like. I mean, unless it's a reference to him being a huge Pretty in Pink fan. Uh, yeah. I'm not happy with it. Isn't that what your nanny's called back home, Ducky? No, well, it's it's it's, it's a little bit PG Woodhouse, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, mate. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mark Wood will play, won't he? They'll if he's fit, rest, if he's fit, yeah. Uh, they'll rest one of the seams, if not both of them. I mean, they've, they've they've been in the field for four four days. Yeah. The game starts what Friday? Yep. Yeah, I mean, surely they'll rest at least one of Anderson and Robinson, mm. and possibly both, and then bring them back for the third test. I'll be I'll be shocked if they both play. I guess they, they didn't bowl 
that much. Like they were very, very well handled by Stokes. I mean, Stokes basically didn't bother bowling himself till day five. Like, mm. um, and it, and it's also not that hot. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, and Ollie but, Robinson brought up in county cricket. But, but he's it's, all about it's, it's the three not day just turnaround. Getting them to the to the first morning of the next mm. game is it? Then you've got to play another five days. Mm, that's true. So you that's know you'll be, you'll be fielding for eight days in in twelve. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see. But also, I mean, from a just cricketing perspective, mm. you know, you see, saw the ball reversing, obviously pays through the air. If Wood is fit, um, then he'll definitely come in, I'd have thought. Mm. But they were but they were both really good. It's, it's tough because this is the, the theory with Wood is that he gets those wickets that, that break the game open, that sort of thing. But England, they did win this game without that. And if you do have two metronomic seamers who are that as that skillful, then if they do the thing that they do for a long enough time, they will also get you breakthroughs i yeah i mean i'd i guess anderson would probably be the one to sit out i mean he is 40 exactly yeah, yeah. um uh fi- finally my favorite question from this week joe asks can we have an abu dhabi t10 update please we had quite a few messages off the last week's show of people particularly enjoying phil's <laughs> thoughts on the abu dhabi t10 um so genuinely watching the test match on sky Without, if you're not really paying attention, it turns onto the Abu Dhabi T10 uh, at the end of play, and we were watching one game where um, someone in the office described it as like watching a, like a, a dad's game, um, and then I said, "That's disrespectful. That's got you know DJ Bravo is playing. He's you know he's still an IPL great, etc." And then next, he's a dad day, many times over. By and then, right. <laughs> and the next day, he announced his IPL retirement, which I thought was fitting. <laughs> didn't didn't uh, Adil Rashid open the batting in one game as well? <laughs> really, really? I, I saw Suresh Raina get quite befuddled underneath a high ball. Uh, and I listened intently to some bants with a Z between Graham Swanee Swan and Nick Comp Dog Compton. Uh, turns out they're drinking multiple b- bottles of wine every night. Um, no doubt drowning their sorrows and hoping for a better way. Mm. Um, there was one of the great scorecards actually from the Abu Dhabi T10 that I'm going to have to get up. <laughs> Um, I wasn't planning on including this, but it's just it's just re-entered my brain. Um, you almost started the show with it, didn't you? And then not 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 far off. <laughs> that was so, my idea. So Basil Hamid um, scored forty-seven off eighteen uh, for a side that included Johnson, Charles, Moeen Ali, David Miller, Shimron Hetmyer, etc., etc. Um, no one else got more than no no none of those guys got more than four. Um, and this <sighs> Basil Hamid got forty-seven for eighteen out of a total of eighty-two for nine. Um, there's there's your scoop yeah and finally finally um spotify unwrapped or spotify wrapped came out this week so thank you for everyone who got in touch um right. i wonder if you're going to bring this up uh thank you for everyone who got in touch um it, it it means it genuinely means a lot to us seeing that you guys listen to shows as much as some of you do but not quite as much as one listener uh a certain sammy who said that he he's been listening? So he spent ten thousand one hundred and three minutes listening to the podcast this year, which Phil worked out as three and a half hours per week. Now the <laughs> average show goes on for about an hour and a bit, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's listening to the same show three times a week. Yeah, we had we had daily podcasts, which were not that, yeah, but only that's for, only, only three for a hours a week. Weeks. Yeah, Sammy, man, you've got it bad. We, we've you've got, got it really, really we've bad. We've got back catalogue. We do have some good special in our back catalogue, actually. If you yeah. go back and listen to maybe some of our decade review ones where we're picking so that, end test of, teams of the uh, of the whatever. Yeah, so there's the end of 2019, there, there were the decade in review stuff. Then in 2020, we had the lockdown ones. Um, and it, uh, I, I'll always I'll always plug it, but uh, the the chat me and Phil had with David Gower was <laughs> the best hour I ha- I've had in this job. Um, so you can always go and go and find that. That was in the depths of lockdown one. Um, but yeah, thank you for all the support and thanks for tagging us in in all your tweets and Instagram posts. Um, Anyway, that is all for today's show. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Ben. Um, Thanks for listening, folks. We'll be back in two days' time to talk about all the other cricket that hasn't been the England men's team.